When I got on board my ship later on, the old mate, who was very full of the events of the morning, remarked, I saw the tug coming back from the outer roads just before 2 p.m. He never by any chance used the words morning or afternoon. Always p.m. or a.m., logbook style. Smart work, that. The man's always in a state of hurry. He's a regular chucker-outer, ain't he, sir? There's a few pubs I know of in the east end of London that would be all the better for one of his sort. Around the bar, he chuckled at his own joke. A regular chucker-outer. Now he has fired out that Dutchman head over heels. I suppose our turn's coming up tomorrow morning. We were all on deck at break of day. Even the sick poor devils had crawled out, ready to cast off in the twinkling of an eye. Nothing came. Falk did not come. At last, when I began to think that probably something had gone wrong in his engine room, we perceived the tug going by full pelt down the river as if we hadn't existed. For a moment I entertained the wild notion that he was going to turn around in the next reach. Afterwards I watched the smoke appear above the plain, now here, now there, according to the windings of the river. It disappeared. Then, without a word, I went down to breakfast. I just simply went down to breakfast. Not one of us uttered a sound till the mate, after imbibing, by means of suction out of a saucer, his second cup of tea, exclaimed, Where the devil is that man gone to? Courting, I shouted, with such a fiendish laugh that the old chap didn't venture to open his lips any more. I started to the office perfectly calm calm with excessive rage. Evidently they knew all about it already, and they treated me to a show of consternation. The manager, a soft-footed, immensely obese man, breathing short, got up to meet me. While the room, the young clerks, bending over the papers on their desks, cast upward glances in my direction. The fat man, without waiting for my complaint, wheezing heavily and in a tone as if he himself were incredulous, conveyed to me the news that Falk, Captain Falk, had declined, had absolutely declined, to tow my ship, to have anything to do with my ship, this day, or any other day. Never. I did my best to preserve a cool appearance. But, all the same, I must have shown how much taken aback I was. We were talking in the middle of the room. Suddenly, behind my back, some ass blew his nose with great force, and at the same time, another quill driver jumped up and went out on the landing hastily. It occurred to me I was cutting a foolish figure there. I demanded angrily to see the principal in his private room. The skin of Mr. Seeger's head showed dead white between the iron-gray streaks of hair lying plastered crosswise from ear to ear over the top of his skull in the manner of a bandage. His narrow sunken face was of a uniform and permanent terracotta color, like a piece of pottery. He was sickly, thin, and short, with wrists like boy of ten, but from that debile body there issued a bullying voice, tremendously loud, harsh, and resonant, as if produced by some powerful mechanical contrivance in the nature of a foghorn. I do not know what he did with it in the private of his home, but in the large sphere of business it presented the advantage of overcoming arguments without the slightest mental effort, by the mere volume of sound. We had had several passages of arms, it took me all I knew to guard the interests of my owners, whom, nota bene, I had never seen, while Seegers, who had made their acquaintance some years before, during a business tour in Australia, pretended to the knowledge of their innermost minds, and, in the character of our very good friends, threw them perpetually at my head. He looked at me with a jaundiced eye. There was no love lost between us and declared at once that it was strange, very strange. His pronunciation of English was so extravagant that I can't even attempt to reproduce it. For instance, he said, Fri uh, combined with bellowing intonation that made the language of one's childhood sound weirdly startling, 
and even if considered purely as a kind of unmeaning noise that filled you with astonishment at first, they had, he continued, been acquainted with Captain Falk for many years, and never had any reason. That's why I come to you, of course, I interrupted. I've the right to know the meaning of this infernal nonsense. In the half-light of the room, which was greenish because of the treetops screening the window, I saw him writhe his meager shoulders. It came into my head as disconnected ideas will come at all sorts of times into one's head that this, most likely, was the very room where, if the tale were true, Falk had been lectured by Mr. Seegers, the father. And Mr. Seegers, the son's overwhelming voice and brassy blasts, as though he had been trying to articulate his words through a trombone, was expressing his great regret at a conduct characterized by a very marked want of discretion. As I lived, I was being lectured to. His deafening gibberish was difficult to follow, but it was my conduct, mine, that, damn, I wasn't going to stand this. What on earth are you driving at, I asked in a passion. I put my hat on, and uh, he never offered a seat to anybody, and as he seemed for the moment struck dumb by my irreverence, I turned my back on him and marched out. His vocal arrangements blared after me a few threats of coming down on the ship for the demurrage of the lighters and all the other expenses consequent upon the delays arising from my frivolity. Once outside in the sunshine, my head swam. It was no longer a question of mere delay. I perceived myself involved in hopeless and humiliating absurdities that were leading me to something very like a disaster. Let us be calm, I muttered to myself, and ran into the shade of a leprous wall. From that short side street, I could see the broad main thoroughfare, ruinous and gay, running away, away between stretches of decaying masonry, bamboo fences, ranges of arcades of brick and plaster, hovels of lath and mud, lofty temple gates of carved timber, huts of rotten masts, an immensely wide thoroughfare, loosely packed as far as the eye could reach, with a barefooted and brown multitude paddling ankle-deep in the dust. For a moment I felt myself about to go out of my mind with worry and desperation. Some allowance must be made for the feelings of a young man new to responsibility. I thought of my crew, half of them were ill, and I really began to think that some of them would end up dying on board if I couldn't get them out to sea soon. Obviously, I should have to take my ship down the river, either working under canvas or dredging with the anchor down, operations which, in common with many modern sailors, I only knew theoretically and I almost shrank from undertaking them shorthand and without local knowledge of the river, which is so necessary for the confident handling of the ship. There were no pilots, no beacons, no buoys of any sort, but there was a very devil of a current for anybody to see. No end of shoal places, and at least two obviously awkward turns of the channel between me and the sea, but how dangerous these turns were, I would not tell. I didn't even know what my ship was capable of. I had never handled her in my life. A misunderstanding between a man and his ship in a difficult river with no room to make it up is bound to end up in trouble for the man. On the other hand, it must be owned, I had not much reason to count upon a general run of good luck and suppose I had the misfortune to pile her high up and dry on some beastly shoal. That would have been the final undoing of that voyage. It was plain that if Falk refused to tow me out, he would also refuse to pull me off. This meant, what, a day lost at the very best, but more likely a whole fortnight of frizzling on some pestilential mud flat of desperate work of discharging cargo, more than likely it meant borrowing money at an exorbitant rate of interest, from the Seegers gang too at that. They were a power in that port, and that elderly seaman of mine, Gambril, 
had looked pretty ghastly when I went forward to dose him with quinine that morning. He would certainly die, not to speak of two or three others that seemed nearly as bad, and of the rest of them just ready to catch any tropical disease going. Horror, ruin, and everlasting remorse, and no help, none. I had fallen amongst a lot of unfriendly lunatics. At any rate, if I must take my ship down myself, it was my duty to procure, if possible, some local knowledge. But that was not easy. The only person I could think of for that service was a certain Johnson, formerly captain of a country ship, but now spliced to a country wife and gone utterly to the bad. I had only heard of him in the vaguest way as living concealed in the thick of 200,000 natives and only emerging into the light of day for the purpose of hunting up some brandy. I had a notion that if I could lay my hands on him, I would sober him on board my ship and use him for a pilot. Better than nothing. Once a sailor, always a sailor. And he had known the river for years. But in our consulate, where I arrived dripping after a sharp walk, they couldn't tell me nothing. The excellent young man on the staff, though willing to help me, belonged to a sphere of the white colony for which that sort of Johnson does not exist. Their suggestion was that I should hunt the man up myself with the help of the consulate's constable, an ex-sergeant major of a regiment of hussars. This man, whose usual duty apparently consisted in sitting behind a little table in an outer room of consular offices, when ordered to assist me in my search for Johnson, displayed lots of energy and a marvelous amount of local knowledge of a sort. But he did not conceal an immense and skeptical contempt for the whole business. We explored together on that afternoon an infinity of infamous grog shops, gambling dens, opium dens. We walked up narrow lanes where our Gary, a tiny box of a thing on wheels, attached to a jibbing Burma bony, could by no means have passed. The constable seemed to be on terms of scornful intimacy with Maltese, with Eurasians, with Chinamen, with Klings, and with the sweepers attached to a temple with whom he talked at the gate. We interviewed also through a grating and a mud wall closely a blind alley an immensely corpulent Italian who, the ex-sergeant major remarked to me perfunctorily, had killed another man last year. Thereupon he addressed him as Antonio, an old buck, through the bloated carcass. Apparently more than half filling the sort of cell wherein it sat, recalled rather a fat pig in a sty. Familiar and never unbending, the sergeant chucked, absolutely chucked, under the chin, a horribly wrinkled and shriveled old hag propped on a stick who had volunteered some sort of information and with the same stolid face he kept up an animated conversation with the groups of swathed brown women who sat smoking chair roots on the doorsteps of a long range of clay hovels. We got out of the gary and clambered into the dwelling airy like packing crates, or descended into places sinister like cellars. We got in, we drove on, we got out, again for the sole purpose as it seemed of looking behind a heap of rubble the sun declined a companion was curt and sardonic in his answer but it appears we were just missing johnson all along at last our conveyance stopped once more with a jerk and the driver jumping down opened the door a black mud hole blocked the lane a mound of garbage crowned with the dead body of a dog rested us not an empty Australian beef tin bounded cheerily before the toe of my boot. Suddenly we clambered through a gap in a prickly fence. It was a very clean native compound, and the big native woman, with bare brown legs as thick as bedposts, pursuing on all fours a silver dollar that came rolling out from somewhere, was Mrs. Johnson herself. Your man's at home, said the ex-sergeant and stepped aside in complete and marked indifference to anything that might follow. Johnson, at home, stood with his back to a native house built on posts, 
and with its walls made of mats. In his left hand he held a banana. Out of the right he dealt another dollar into space. The woman captured this one on the wing, and there and then plumped down on the ground to look at us with greater comfort. My man was sallow of face, grizzled, unshaven, muddy on elbows and back, where the seams of his Sir J. coat yawned, you could see his white nakedness. The vestiges of a paper collar encircled his neck. He looked at us with a grave swaying surprise. Where do you come from? he asked. My heart sank. How could I have been stupid enough to waste my energy and time for this? But having already gone so far as I approached a little nearer and declared the purpose of my visit, he would have come to me at once, sleep on board my ship, and tomorrow with the first ebb of the tide he would give me his assistance in getting my ship down to the sea without steam. A 600 ton bark drawing nine feet aft, I proposed to give him eighteen dollars for his local knowledge, and all the time I was speaking he kept on considering attentively the various aspects of the banana, holding first one side up to his eyes, then the other. You've forgotten to apologize, he said, at last with extreme precision. Not being a gentleman yourself, you don't know apparently when you intrude upon a gentleman, I am. I wish you to understand that when I am in funds, I don't work. And now, I would have pronounced him perfectly sober hadn't he paused in great concern to try and brush a hole off the knee of his trousers. I have money and friends. Every gentleman has. Perhaps you would like to know my friend. His name is Falk. You could borrow some money. Try to remember. Falk. F-A-L-K. Abruptly his tone changed. A noble heart, he said muzzily. Has Falk been giving you some money, I asked, appalled by the detailed finish of the dark plot. Lent me, my good man, not given, lent, he corrected suavely. Met me taking the air last evening, and being as usual anxious to oblige, hadn't you better go to the devil out of my compound? And upon this, without other warning, he let fly with the banana, which missed my head and took the constable just under the left eye. He rushed at the miserable Johnson, stammering with fury. They fell, but why dwell on the wretchedness, the breathlessness, the degradation, the senselessness, the weariness, the ridiculousness, and humiliation, and, and the perspiration of these moments? I dragged the ex-hosser off. He was like a wild beast. It seems he had been greatly annoyed at losing his, his free afternoon on my account. The garden of his bungalow required his personal attention, and at the slight blow of the banana, the brood in him broke loose. We left Johnson on his back, still black in the face, but beginning to kick feebly. Meantime, the big woman had remained sitting on the ground, apparently paralyzed with extreme terror. For half an hour, we jolted a inside our rolling box, side by side, in profound silence. The ex-sergeant was busy staunching the blood of a long scratch on his cheek. I hope you're satisfied, he said suddenly. That's what comes of all that tomfool business. If you hadn't quarreled with that tugboat skipper over some girl or other, all this wouldn't have happened. You heard that story, I said? Of course I heard, and I shouldn't wonder if the consul general himself doesn't come to hear of it. How am I to go before him tomorrow with that thing on my cheek? I want to know. It's you who ought to have got this. After that, till the Gary stopped and he jumped out without leave-taking, he swore to himself steadily, horribly, muttering great purposeful trooper oaths to which the worst sailor can do is like the prattle of a child. For my part, I had just the strength to crawl into Schomburg's coffee room, where I wrote at a little table a note to the mate instructing him to get everything ready for dropping down the river the next day. I couldn't face my ship. Well, she had a clever sort of skipper, and no mistake, poor thing. What a horrid mess. I took my head between my hands. At times, the obviousness of my innocence would reduce me to despair. 
What had I done? If I had done something to bring about the situation, I should at least have learned not to do it again. But I felt guiltless to the point of imbecility. The room was empty, yet only Schomburg prowled round me, goggle-eyed, and with a sort of odd, respectful curiosity. No doubt he had set the story going himself, but he was a good-hearted chap, and I am really persuaded he participated in all my troubles. He did what he could for me, he ranged aside the heavy match stand, set a chair straight, pushed the spittoon slightly with his foot, as you show small attentions to a friend under great sorrow, sighed, and at last, unable to hold his tongue, well, I warned you, Captain, that's what comes of running your head against Mr. Falk. Man'll stick at nothing. I sat without stirring, and after surveying me with a sort of commiseration in his eyes, he burst out in a hoarse whisper. But for a fine lump of a girl, she is a fine lump of a girl. He made a loud smacking noise with his thick lips. The finest lump of a girl that I ever, he was going on with great unction, but for some reason or other he broke off. I fancied myself throwing something at his head. I don't blame you, Captain. Hang me if I do, he said with a patronizing air. Thank you, I said resignedly. It was no use fighting against this false fate. I don't know even if I was sure myself where the truth of the matter began. The conviction that it would end disastrously had been driven into me by all the successive shocks my sense of security had received. I began to ascribe an extraordinary potency to agents in themselves powerless. It was as if Schomburg's baseless gossip had the power to bring about the thing itself, or the abstract enmity of Falk could be put on ship ashore. I have already explained how fatal this last would have been, my further action, my youth, my inexperience, my very real concern for the health of my crew must be my excuse. The action itself, when it came, was purely impulsive. It was set in movement, quite undiplomatically, and simply by Falk's appearance in the doorway. The room was full by then and buzzing with voices. I had been looked at with curiosity by everyone, but how I am to describe the sensation produced by the appearance of Falk himself blocking the doorway. The tension of expectation could be measured by the profundity of the silence that fell upon the very click of the billiard balls. As to Schomburg, he looked extremely frightened. He hated mortally any sort of row. Fracas, he called it, in his establishment. Fracas was bad for business, he affirmed, but in truth the specimen of portly middle-aged manhood was of a timid disposition. I don't know what, considering my presence in the place, they all hoped would come of it, a sort of stag fight, perhaps, or they may have supposed Falk had come in only to annihilate me completely. As a matter of fact, Falk had come in because Hermann had asked him to inquire after the precious white cotton parasol, which in the worry and excitement of the previous day, he had forgotten at the table where he had held our conversation. It was this that gave me my opportunity. I don't think I would have gone to seek Falk out. No, I don't think so. There are limits. But there was an opportunity, and I seized it. I have already tried to explain why. I will merely state that, in my opinion, to get his sickly crew into the sea air and secure a quick dispatch for his ship, a skipper would be justified in going to any length short of absolute crime. He should put his pride in his pocket. He may accept confidences, explain his innocence as if it were a sin. He may take advantage of misconceptions, of desires, of weaknesses, he ought to conceal his horror and other emotions, and if the fate of a human being, and that human being being a magnificent young girl, is strangely involved, why he should contemplate that fate, whatever it might seem to be, without turning a hair. And all these things I have done, the explaining, the listening, the pretending, even to the discretion, and nobody, not even Hermann's niece, I believe, he throw a stone at me now. 
Schomburg, at all events, needn't since from the first to last, I am happy to say, there was not the slightest fracas. Overcoming a nervous contraction of the windpipe, I had managed to exclaim Captain Falk. His start of surprise was perfectly genuine, but afterwards he neither smiled nor scowled. He simply waited. Then, when I had said, I must have a talk with you, and had pointed to a chair at my table, he moved up to me, though he didn't sit down. Schomburg, however, with a long tumbler in his hand, was making towards us prudently, and I discovered that the only sign of weakness in Falk, he had for Schomburg a repulsion resembling that sort of physical fear some people experience at the sight of a toad, perhaps to a man so essentially and silently concentrated upon himself that he could talk well enough, as I was to find out presently. The other's irrepressible loquacity, embracing every human being within range of the tongue, might have appeared unnatural, disgusting, and monstrous. He suddenly gave signs of restiveness, positively like a horse about to rear and muttering hurriedly, as if in great pain. No, I can't stand that fellow, seemed ready to bolt. This weakness of his gave me the advantage at the very start. Veranda, I suggested, as if rendering him a service, and walked him out by the arm. We stumbled over a few chairs, we had the feeling of open space before us, and felt the fresh breath of the river, fresh but tainted, the Chinese theaters across the water made, and the sparsely twinkling masses of gloom an eastern town presents at night, blazing centers of light and of distance and howling uproar, I felt become suddenly tractable again like an animal, like a good-tempered horse when the object that scares him is removed. Yes, I felt in the darkness there how tractable he was, without my conviction of his inflexibility, tenacity, rather perhaps, being in the least weakened. His very arm, abandoning itself to my grasp, was as hard as marble like a limb of iron, but I heard a tumultuous scuffling of boot soles within. The unspeakable idiots inside were crowding to the windows, climbing over each other's backs behind the blinds, billiard cues and all. Somebody broke a window pane, and with the sound of falling glass, so suggestive of riot and devastation, Schomburg reeled out after us in a state of funk which had prevented his parting with his brandy and soda. He must have trembled like an aspen leaf. The piece of ice and the long tumbler he held in his hand tinkled with an effect of chattering teeth. I beg you, gentlemen, he expostulated thickly. Come, really, now, I must insist. How proud I am of my presence of mind. Hello, I said instantly in a loud and naive tone. Somebody's breaking your window, Schomburg. Would you please tell one of your boys to bring out here a pack of cards and a couple of lights, and two long drinks, will you? To receive an order soothed him at once. It was business. Certainly, he said in an immensely relieved tone. The night was rainy, and with wandering gusts of wind, and while we waited for the candles... Fox said, as if to justify his panic, I don't interfere in anybody's business. I don't give anyone occasion for talk. I'm a respectable man, but this fellow is always making out something wrong and can never resist till he gets somebody to believe him. This was the first of my knowledge of Falk, this desire of respectability, of being like everybody else, was the only recognition he vouchsafed to the organization of mankind. For the rest, he might have been the member of a herd, not of a society. Self-preservation was his only concern. Not selfishness, but mere self-preservation. Selfishness presupposes consciousness, choice, the presence of other men. But his instinct acted as though he were the last of mankind, nursing that law like the only spark of a sacred fire. I don't mean to say that living naked in a cavern would have satisfied him. Obviously, he was the creature of the conditions to which he was born. No doubt self-preservation meant also the preservation of these conditions. 
but essentially it meant something much more simple, natural, and powerful. How shall I express it? It meant the preservation of the five senses of his body. Let us say, taking it in its narrowest as well as the widest meaning. I think you will admit before long the justice of this judgment. However, as we stood there together in the dark veranda, I had judged nothing as yet, and I had no desire to judge, which is an idle practice anyhow. The light was long in coming. Of course, I said in a tone of mutual understanding, it isn't exactly a game of cards I want with you. I saw him draw his hands down his face, the vague stir of passionate and meaningless gesture, but he waited in silent patience. It was only when the lights had been brought out that he opened his lips. I understood his mumble to mean he didn't know any game. Like this, Schomburg and all the other fools will have to keep off, I said, tearing open the pack. Have you heard that we are universally supposed to be quarreling about a girl? You know, a who, of course. I am really ashamed to ask, but is it possible that you do me the honor to think me dangerous? As I said these words, I felt how absurd it was, and also how I felt flattered, for really, what else could it be? His answer, spoken in his usual dispassionate undertone, made it clear that it was so, but not precisely as flattering as I supposed. He thought me dangerous with Hermann more than with the girl herself. But as to quarreling, I saw at once how inappropriate the word was. We had no quarrel. Natural forces are not quarrelsome. You can't quarrel with the wind that inconveniences and humiliates you by blowing off your hat in a street full of people. He had no quarrel with me. Neither would a boulder falling on my head have had. He fell upon me and in accordance with the law by which he was moved, not of gravitation like a detached stone, but of self-preservation. Of course, this is giving it a rather wide interpretation. Strictly speaking, he had existed and could have existed without being married, yet he told me that he had found it more and more difficult to live alone. Yes, he told me and this in his low, careless voice, to such a pitch of confidence had arrived at the end of a half an hour. It took me just about that time to convince him that I had never dreamed of marrying Hermann's niece. Could any necessity have been more extravagant? And the difficulty was the greater because he was so hard hit that he couldn't imagine anybody being able to remain in a state of indifference. Any man with eyes in his head, he seemed to think, could not help coveting so much lovely magnificence. This profound belief was conveyed by the manner he listened, sitting sideways to the table and playing absently with a few cards I had dealt to him at random. And the more I saw into him, the more I saw of him. The wind swayed the lights so that his sunburnt face, whiskered to the eyes, seemed to successively flicker crimson at me and to go out. I saw the extraordinary breadth of the high cheekbones, the perpendicular style of the features, the massive forehead, steep like a cliff, denuded at the top, largely uncovered at the temples. The fact is, I had never before seen him without his hat, but now, as if my fervor had made him hot, he had taken it off and laid it gently on the floor. Something peculiar in the shape and setting of his yellow eyes gave them the provoking silent intensity which characterized his glance. But the face was thin, furrowed, worn. I discovered that through the bush of his hair, as you may detect, the gnarled shape of a tree trunk lost in a dense undergrowth. These overgrown cheeks were sunken, it was an anchorite's bony head fitted with a capuchin's beard and adjusted to a Herculean body. I don't mean athletic. Hercules, I take it, was not an athlete. He was a strong man, susceptible to female charms, and not afraid of dirt. And thus with Falk, who was a strong man, 
He was extremely strong, just as the girl, since I must think of them together, was magnificently attractive by the masterful power of flesh and blood, expressed in shape and size and attitude, that is, by a straight appeal to the senses. His mind, meantime, preoccupied with respectability, quailed before Schomburg's tongue and seemed absolutely impervious to my protestations. And I went so far as to protest that I would just as soon think of marrying my mother's dear old lady, faithful female cook, as Hermann's niece. Sooner I protested my disparation, much sooner, but it does not appear that he saw anything outrageous in the proposition, and in his skeptical immobility he seemed to nurse the argument that at all events the cook was very, very far away. It must be said that just before I had gone wrong by appealing to the evidence of my manner whenever I called on board the Diana. I had never attempted to approach the girl or speak to her, or even to look at her in any marked way. Nothing could be clearer. But as his own idea of, let us say, courting, seemed to consist precisely in sitting silently for hours in the vicinity of the beloved object, that line of argument inspired in him distrust. Staring down his extended legs, he let out a grunt, as much as to say, that's all very fine, but you can't throw dust in my eyes.